I always hope to start out the week with good news for everyone, but this was a very, very tough weekend. And I was in the Rockways last night with the family of Justin Wallace, and it was just the most painful thing. It was horrible. Ten-year-old child should be alive today, should be in school right now, killed by a cowardly, horrible human being who fired gunshots just randomly into a home. The pain that Justin's parents are feeling right now, no parent should ever go through that. No one should ever experience that. Every parent, and I'm going to speak as a parent myself, fears constantly deep down that we might not follow the way it's supposed to in life. You're supposed to see your children live their lives out and you're supposed to leave this earth ahead of them. These parents were grappling with the sudden, shocking, horrible loss of their beautiful 10-year-old child. They showed me videos and photos and told stories and they veered between shock and pain and rage and they kept saying, we need to know that this killer will be found. And I told them, yes, the NYPD will find the killer. Yes, he will be brought to justice. He will suffer the consequences of what he did. The, the fact that this reality in our nation, in our city, that a child's life is taken by gun violence is something we are way too used to is unacceptable. And we have work to do in this city. We cannot have this situation. Last summer, I had the, the same kind of painful, horrible experience with Devell Gardner Jr.'s mom and grandmother in front of their house, hearing the loss they felt, seeing it happen again. It's not acceptable. It has to stop. It has to stop. It's going to take so many effort, so much work, but it has to stop because this is not a way for us to live. We are doing everything we can here in the city, but we need help. We need help from the federal government. We need help from the state government. We cannot do it alone. What can we do? The plan we've put forward moving our cops to the right places, focusing on the top 100 blocks where violence has occurred, the new cops coming out of the police academy, 850 last month, 600 this month, using that new capacity the right way, working with communities, investing in cure violence in the crisis management system, community-based solutions to violence, getting our courts up and running. The courts are run by the state, but we've offered every form of help with vaccination, uh, space, whatever they needed. We need the courts at full strength so there are real consequences. These are things that are all happening now. They will all have an impact. But we cannot do it alone. The situation that we're seeing now is unacceptable. It's fueled by the proliferation of guns that got worse during the pandemic. We've all seen the shocking statistics about how many more people all over the country got guns during the pandemic. Look, the NYPD is out there getting guns off the street all the time. Gun arrests are up 28% compared to last year. That's making a huge difference. But the flow of guns is endless into the city. So we need Congress to act. Last night, after we spent time with the family, I saw the passion in the face of Queensboro President Donovan Richards. He knows this family. He knows the Wallace family. He felt their pain very personally, and he said, we've got to stop the flow of guns. We need Congress to finally act. And he said something that really touched me. He said, is this the final straw? Is this the, is this the tragedy that will finally convince our lawmakers in Washington to act? We thought it was Newtown. We thought it was so many of these horrible mass killings. Is this the one that might finally wake people up? Washington has the opportunity now first opportunity in quite a while to act. We need them. We need the state of New York as well. 
We have been talking for weeks now with the state legislature. And there's something that we can all do together that would really help in conversations with the legislative leaders and members of the legislature, we found a lot of common ground on a crucial issue, the issue of parole. This is an area where real change can happen quickly, and we need all the help we can get. Uh, some good news today on this front, Assembly Member Maritza Davila has introduced a new bill that will strengthen the parole system. You'll hear from her in a moment. Here's the bottom line. In the city of New York, we focus on planning for when people are going to re-enter society coming out of jail. We focus on really making sure people are ready, giving them a transitional job, giving them real support. Unfortunately, historically, the state of New York has not done that. As we've talked with legislators in the Senate and the Assembly, there's been a lot of agreement that that's not fair to anyone. It's not fair to the parolee trying to re-enter society who we want to rehabilitate. It's not fair to members of the community who are actually put in danger by the fact that there's no good alternative provided to a parolee. The sad reality is that the state government dumps state prisoners, parolees, into New York City, often directly into our shelters, in a way that doesn't help anyone. And the facts are clear. State parolees are more likely to be shooting suspects than they have been in the past. They are four times more likely to be involved in gun violence than others who have been involved in the criminal justice system. We see a specific problem and we can do something about it. And we can do something about it in a way that is understanding and compassionate, but also forceful. Reentry planning, discharge planning, housing, health support, including mental health support, making sure people have some employment. These are things that would make a huge difference and help keep us safe. I want you to hear from the assembly member who is carrying this bill. I want to thank her. I've known her for a long time. She fights so hard for her community. She's from her community, from the neighborhood. She's lived the challenges of her neighborhood in Brooklyn, and she stands up for people, and she is leading the way to make a change that we need to make New York City safer. My pleasure to introduce assembly member Maritza Davila. Thank you, Mayor uh, de Blasio. First, I would like to give my deepest condolences to that family. Um, I can't even imagine how um, waking up in the morning and not having your child because someone decided to take um, your child away, and, and that is not, it's, it's just not right. Um, but I, I would like to say that there may be a light, um, you know, uh, far away from that tunnel, but we are working in uniform with the city. Um, so what we are doing on a state level is introducing Bill 8022. Um, the legislation will ensure uh, that when a person is released um, on parole, they have a comprehensive wraparound uh, project or program services. Um, that, that will include housing, employment, medical services or insurance, substance abuse, and mental health. Um, providing people with these services will ensure that they have a better chance of becoming um, productive members of society. Uh, the goal of parole is to rehabilitate offenders um, and guide them back into society while minimizing um, the likelihood that they will commit a new offense. Uh, parolees are, uh, as we see, coming home uh, without anything. Uh, they've been separated from support, uh, and, and that has greatly impacted our city as well as the state. Uh, building a bridge or creating a bridge that will um, give them an, op an opportunity to be able to uh, be successful um, is what we should be doing. We should not be releasing prisoners uh, from uh, docks or jails that will, you know, more than likely commit more crimes if they don't have services. And um, this is, I, I think, a better way to monitor also a parolee is to see, you know, whether or not they're abiding by these rules. Uh, and so, um, it's a great bill. Um, it's something that we all need in our city and state. And I am very pleased and proud to be able to carry that on the state level. Thank you so much, 
Assembly member, thank you. This is a really important moment for New York City. This is the kind of change we need. It can only happen from Albany. Uh, your leadership is making a big difference. I know you're really a respected voice among the members in Albany, so thank you for your leadership. It's going to help us save lives. Now, I want to hear from another Assembly member who really cares about these issues. Uh, he and I spoke recently about how important it is to help people come back the right way. If we're going to do rehabilitation, we have to do it the right way. But it also is the way to keep people safe, everyone in the community safe. Uh, he is someone who has organized and fought for his community and now has gone to the assembly to bring that same spirit of change to the work he does there. I pleasure to introduce the chair of the subcommittee on reentry and transitional services, New York State Assembly member Kenny Burgos. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I appreciate you having me here today. Uh, as I've been speaking today, first off, I want to say, you know, my heart goes out to the family of you know, the victim who lost his life this weekend. You know, gun violence is an incredible tragedy for that family and for New Yorkers all over. It's, it's a tragedy and violence affects everyone, no matter what zip code you live in. It's something that everyone worries about. And we want to live in a safe city and, and we love New York City and want to keep it safe. Uh, as you say, I chair the subcommittee on reentry and transitional services, and obviously the biggest focus of mine is making sure that we create a system that focuses on rehabilitation and not punishment, because we have to cure the problem from the root. I'm a big believer that gun violence is a symptom of poverty, of housing insecurity, and of lack of mental health treatment. So when we make these priorities, when we change our system, to not put a scarlet letter on individuals being released back into our society, we can help them on a path to success. But if we're gonna block them every step of the way, we will only create a system that continues to spiral in this repetitive circle and we will always continue to deal with these issues. Uh, so again, my, my priorities, you know, with the Assemblywoman Davila, I'm, I'm proud of this bill because I truly believe when we work in tandem with our city, with our state and our federal partners, this is how we address gun violence. I want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for leading the charge on this, you know, um, setting the model of the city. You uh, rolled this plan out in Rikers, working on reentry, making sure we have comprehensive reentry, right? Focusing on mental health, focusing on housing, focusing on health care. That's the only way we're going to set people up for success. So with our state population, our state jail population being so heavily skewed with New York City residents, it is now our responsibility to take that same approach because the individuals throughout the state population, the state jail population, are going to be coming back to our city. So we are in the last legislative session. Um, summertime is approaching or here in New York City. And unfortunately, with summertime, we know gun violence spikes. So I think it's imperative for all of us right now to work on these issues, to address it now so we can have a safe summer ahead and continue to be the biggest safe city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Thank you. And Assembly member, I appreciate uh, what you said about what we have found works. Uh, when I came into office at Rikers, uh, there was one day a week for inmates for education and training. We made that five days a week. There wasn't real intensive discharge planning. We put that into place. There were no jobs for people to go to. We gave transitional jobs to folks coming out of Rikers. These are the things that work. It's time for the state of New York to take that model and make it happen for folks who are coming out with even more serious challenges coming out of the state system. And I really appreciate uh, your leadership on this, particularly chairing the subcommittee you do. So thank you so much, Assembly Member. Thank you. Now, everyone, I want to hear from one more member of the Assembly, and uh, her uh, vantage point here is particularly crucial. Uh, she represents a community in the Bronx that is dealing with so many challenges and knows too well the pain of gun violence. But she has been a difference maker as a social worker. She understands that how we reach people, the systematic, focused way we reach people and get them help can make all the difference, and that we need solutions like this to actually save lives. My pleasure to introduce Assemblymember Chantel Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for this important uh, conversation that we're having, and thank you for engaging us, Assembly members, uh, recently to discuss this issue of gun violence. My heart bleeds for this family, and like you said, I've known way too many families who have 
lost young people to gun violence. Um, I actually tried to be assembly member with Davila to, to this bill. I thought it was such an important one and absolutely necessary for our state um, because like I've mentioned in so many conversations, the social services are, is what we are lacking and that's what we're going to offer people at this point when this bill passes. We need to make sure that people have wraparound services um, when they are released from prison because we know if you don't have the, these services, you're going to end up doing the same things that got you there in the first place. And so um, it is absolutely important that we, you know, we make sure that people have housing, we make sure that they have health care, we make sure that they have education so that they don't end up in these same situations terrorizing our community. And, and I, when I say our community, that's exactly what I mean, because it's not, you know, outside people coming in and destroying it. And I also understand that this, this is happening because we don't have enough social service and we don't have enough conflict resolution. And so these are things that we need to be focusing on. So I'm grateful for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for presenting it. And I'm, I'm great. I'm hoping that this state will get this passed uh, this week. So much, Assembly Member, with your help, uh, it can be done and it will make such a difference. And thank you. We talked about what it means to be a social worker. Now, as an elected official, you bring a powerful perspective. And we realize we actually can reach people and change their lives, but only if we actually take the steps to do it in a purposeful, intentional manner. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Right. Now, everyone, I want to hear from one more expert. And what a uh, extraordinary individual. I've gotten to know Julio Medina over the years. I've seen the work that Exodus Transitional Services does helping folks re-enter society, helping redeem lives. Folks who otherwise might have gone astray again, being put on a positive path, not committing acts of violence, not being victims of acts of violence. And this is the crucial thing to remember. Parolees are very, very frequently the victims of gun violence and too frequently the perpetrators of gun violence because in so many cases there isn't an effort to keep them away from what were the negative influences of the past and the problems of the past. But at Exodus, we have seen a model that works to provide the transitional services, the help, the housing, the mental health support, whatever it takes. And uh, Julio is someone who feels this deeply. He'll tell you about his own experience, but he has saved lives many times. And I honor him for it. My pleasure to introduce Julio Medina. Hey, uh, thank you so much. It uh, means a lot to me. Marisa, thank you so much for, for your bill. That's what uh, that's definitely what makes all the difference in the world. Um, and, man, let me just go back. You know, I have a 13-year-old and, and a 15-year-old as well. And, uh, you know, every time they walk out the door, I live in the Bronx, you know, uh, I'm concerned. And that concern is very real. So, you know, we're doing all in our power to make certain that, you know, we can prevent gun violence here at Exodus. Um, but with that said, I think, you know, one of the things I'm just going to mention is, is kind of this discharge planning process, that understanding that you, the hope that you are providing. Um, personally, I served 12 years in prison. Uh, at one point, I was unfortunately part of the problem. Um, you know, during that process, one wakes up and one begins to realize how do we come back and really restore and help the communities we once unfortunately helped destroy. And at Exodus, that's what we're doing. So when I, you know, in my day, there was no discharge planning. You kind of just, you know, get out and figure it out. Uh, and that continues to happen today. So one of the things that, you know, we want to just put it bluntly, um, without discharge planning, the possibility of going back is very real. The possibility of another crime being committed is very real. So again, I just want to salute, you know, all of you who, who put this bill in place, in motion and there's something we, that it just has to pass. And more importantly, you know, uh, the state doing this, I know the city has been way ahead of the curve in, in providing these services, but understanding the thousands of people that are released yearly, uh, you know, we have to start at Exodus, we start the planning once they get out, unfortunately. We have a couple of programs inside of prison, uh, but the pandemic hasn't allowed us to stay inside. So the unfortunate reality is we begin when they get out. And when we're behind the curve, but we do a great job at trying to make sure we can identify some of those those areas that are needed. But, you know, to think about housing insecurity, mental health, trauma, uh, employability, the disease of addiction, um, 
and really focusing in on that and having a plan in place to be able to say, you know what, this is your course, this is your plan, you get out. That tells that person coming out, wow, Darcel cares about me, Maritza cares about people care about me in my community that I'm coming back to. This isn't no longer about, you know, on parole, let's figure out a way to get you back into prison. Let's figure out anything you do, curfew, et cetera, et cetera, to get you back. This is more about restoring a person to their fullness, to the full potential that God has made them. So for us, it's, it's you know, again, this is one of those areas that we are really, really excited about. Um, one of the things I want to say, you know, this is definitely a game changer. You know, we, um, when we think about some of the stuff that's happened throughout the pandemic, you know, at Exodus, we manage for the hotels for Mock J. And I just want to say, you know, we're working with a team at Mock J of, of Marcos and, and Dana and Anna and Andy. Um, this is a team that's feet are on the ground. And these four hotels have folk coming back from Rikers Island, folk coming back from state prison who, who don't have a place to go. And these hotels provided an opportunity for them to be restored. Hotels provided them an opportunity to do some of the work that is necessary to get back. I mean, just think of trying to apply for a job, but you have no address. Just think of trying to get to a healthcare appointment, but there's no place you're leaving from. Um, so I think, you know, in the last 22 years of doing this work, um, I want to say, you know, one of the key factors in here is security. And right now we're building a system, I think, for all New Yorkers that are impacted by the justice system to say, we have a place for you to begin and start your life. I think for us, what we're doing, we're seeing that at the hotels. And let me tell you a quick story. You know, I got a billion of them. We service 3,000 people a year in East Harlem. Uh, but let me tell you this one. Uh, uh, brother came home after 20 years, homeless. Uh, we were able to put him in one of our hotels. Uh, he ended up, after a couple of months, uh, getting an ID. Because as you know how difficult getting an ID during a pandemic was. Um, and just think of us, right, walking around without an ID. So we, we finally got the brother an ID. He didn't have to walk around with his prison ID. Um, and then he found a job. He went through some programming. He was able to find a job, address some of the trauma that brought him to prison. And I want to make sure we talk about that underlying dilemma of trauma that folk are leaving, going into prison and leaving prison with. Um, and long story short, this brother's not employed, has his own apartment. And I think he's not he's not the, an aberration. He's the norm. We can do this for everyone. But I think putting the resources where we need them, continuing to do this work, I think housing first for all justice impacted people is the place to start. Grateful to be here. Mayor, thank you. Maritza, thank you. My sister Darcel, good seeing you. Appreciate all of y'all and the work that we're doing. And let's continue to move this dial forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julio. I really honor and admire your work. I appreciate that story you told because it said it all. And I want all New Yorkers to just hear what Julio said about himself. Something went wrong in his life, 12 years in prison. And then he came out and for the last 22 years has been serving people in need and helping rehabilitate and helping save lives. That is what redemption is all about. God bless you, Julio. Thank you, God brother. Bless. All right, now. This bill to reform parole, to make sure that people come back safely, to make sure that we stop the violence. We need this bill. We need to pass it this week in Albany. It can be done. There's a lot of support. Thank you to everyone who spoke, and thank you to all the members of the Senate and the Assembly who have stepped forward and said we have to get this done. Let me say that's what we think can happen this week in this legislative session. We've had ongoing conversations with Albany as well about the kinds of things that need to happen going forward. Uh, I, for one, believe that the legislature will be back later on this year. Uh, we're going to continue the conversations in the meantime. Uh, criminal justice work needs constant assessment. We're unfortunately dealing with a very clear rise in gun violence here and around the country. We need to keep looking at our criminal justice laws, keep looking at other changes we need to make. And that's an ongoing conversation we're having with the members of the legislature. Now, specifically, another area of concern and I do not believe it will be acted on this week, but I think it can be acted on this year, is witness protection. Uh, we know how important it is to encourage witnesses to come forward. The NYPD has done a lot of work lately to rebond with communities. This is something that Chief Rodney Harrison, our Chief of Department, has talked about a lot. We need to reconnect the police department communities. We need to get the comfort and the relationship and the discussion going that neighborhood policing helped create for six years. We need to amplify that again. 
We need folks coming forward when they witnessed a crime. But we understand that's particularly sensitive if someone witnessed the most serious crimes. Uh, obviously, violence, rape, homicide. Uh, witnesses can be scared. Witnesses can be hesitant. We've seen more of that hesitancy. Witnesses have cooperated only in 25% of the shootings this year. Just a few years ago, that number was 53% in 2017. Obviously, we need to keep adjusting our laws and our approaches to encourage witness cooperation. We also need to understand that while we're making very important reforms, and I commend the legislature for so many of the reforms they've made, including in the area of discovery, we also have to look for any unintended consequences. And there are issues about some of the procedural requirements in the discovery law that have raised real concerns among the district attorneys, areas where some smart tweaks and revisions could really help to ensure that we can get gun violence cases completed and make sure that folks who mean to do violence against a fellow New Yorker are off the streets. I want you to hear from the district attorney of the Bronx. She has literally devoted her life to keeping the people of the Bronx safe. She's someone who believes in reform, but also believes in safety and believes those two ideas have to go together and can go together. She's proven it in the work she does with her extraordinary team in the Bronx DA's office. My pleasure to introduce District Attorney Darcel Clark. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for having me. First and foremost, I'd like to send my condolences, my thoughts, and my prayers to the family of Justin uh, Wallace. Uh, what a tragedy, a young man, so young, gone, days before his birthday. It's almost like his date of birth and his date of death could have been the same day. Absolutely horrible and unacceptable what we're dealing with with the gun violence in our communities right now. And I see people at their worst as district attorney. So I know that. So again, my heart, you know, my prayers go out to that family. But you know what, this is gun, this is uh, gun violence awareness month, June is. And we are very aware of the gun violence because of situations like we just saw in Queens, like we saw in the Bronx. I also had a 12 year old um, shot uh, this weekend. You know, we cannot tolerate this. So Mr. Mayor, your safe summer NYC, where you want community cops and the courts together, that's the way to go. In addition, I want to give credit to my um, colleagues in government, the assembly members who all spoke about that parole bill. That is one of the ways to end the vicious cycle of gun violence that we have. People returning home, if they don't have the resources, they're going to um, recidivate and go right back to what they happened. Exodus, you're doing a wonderful job as well. All of this is a plan that has to go together. You can't have one without the other. The reform is necessary, but we also have to pay attention to what is happening in our communities. So, you know, that's why I had a march on Friday for Gun Violence Awareness Day to bring attention to this, to let the communities know that we care about them. I marched right in the be belly of the beast, right through those areas in the Bronx where these gang members sit and they're shooting and so many homicides and things happened along the walk that we did. And those communities were happy to see the DA there, to see the police there, to see our pure violence partners there. All of us together, the clergy, the youth, that is the way that we're going to get ahead and solve this gun violence. So safe from in New York City, I'm proud to be a partner with you on that. My, my plan for the summer is called Bronx Peace, which I'm calling peace because it's precision enforcement and community engagement. Mr. May, you're absolutely right. You talked about we can be safe and have reform and be fair at the same time. And that's what I'm willing to do. So these shootings now, I'm taking them very seriously. I have a team of experienced ADAs that are treating shootings like homicides. That's how serious it is now because some of them eventually become homicides, but we gotta do prevention before that even happens. Let's get out there and investigate that. So they're doing that kind of work. We're working with NYPD, the gang um, division, the gun suppression division, with the federal authorities to deal with these uh, individuals who are priority offenders or who are the crime drivers. It's not everybody in our community. We know that. 
And we need to take our communities back and tell those who think they can bring this harm that they don't belong here and we don't want it here. You talk about witness cooperation. Mr. Mayor, I have been preaching this to the choir for I don't know how long. It is so difficult to get people to cooperate. I started a witness protection program in my office where I will do anything I can for those courageous Bronxites who will come forward and cooperate with the police and my office so that we can hold these people accountable. But we have to do more. And any laws that can change that can strengthen the help for witnesses so that they can cooperate so we can change the narratives on these shootings, I absolutely support and hope that we'll be able to do that. These are courageous people and they deserve to be protected. And as New Yorkers and Bronxites, I know that we can get it done. You talk about the courts. We are working the courts, you know, although not at full capacity, never closed. We were still processing people who were committing crimes. But now things are opening up and I'm working in partnership with the courts. And I know the mayor's office has been very helpful that we're making a priority of these violent cases going to trial first. That's what we're doing to make sure that um, people are held accountable and that these victims finally get their day in court. So we're doing that. Community engagement, though, is the key. You are absolutely right. We need to bring more access to our cure violence group and our crisis management uh, workers. They are the key. They stand in the gap because they meet the people where they are. They're the ones that can stop the individual from picking up the gun before they decide to do it. That's what they do to help me day in and day out. I don't expect them to walk the witnesses in. That's not their job. Their job is to be in the community, to be um, credible messengers to those individuals to tell them there's an alternative to this. You don't have to do things this way. And they have a story to tell them, um, just, just like um, um, Julio did earlier. That you are the credible message. You are the ones that can get to them most of all. And those returning home, re-entry is a big part of this plan as well. They have to have the resources. I've been saying this for a long time, and as a former judge, I know this to be true. I'm somebody that sentenced people to jail and state prison. And I knew even then as a judge, and now more importantly as a DA, that you have to have the resources to stop them from starting that vicious cycle all over again. So we can all do this, you know, we can do this together. I've been working at this all my, you know, all my life, you know. I'm not new to this, I'm true to this. And I want to make sure that it works. So, Mr. Mayor, anything that you need in order for us to stop the scourge of gun violence, I'm there to do it. I work with the Kill Violence Group. I'm going to continue to have my resource fairs. I'm going to open up Play Streets. I have the Saturday Night Life Program for our youth. This is what we have to do. And most importantly, we have to develop alternatives to violence training as well. So people can know that they have options, ways to cope with the trauma. Let's bring that there to mental health. All of those things we can do. And Mr. Mayor, you have a partner in me to make sure that we get that done. Thank you so much, District Attorney. I really appreciate that. I appreciate your passion and your belief that we can bring all these pieces together to keep the Bronx safe and the whole city safe. And I think it's really important that people note you're the chief law enforcement officer in the Bronx, and you're talking about the community solutions as well. You really appreciate, and it's something I appreciate about you, the whole bandwidth, courts, DAs, police, but also cure violence movement, crisis management system. I'm proud to say we have doubled uh, the number of members of cure violence crisis management for this summer. It will triple for next summer, working with the city council. We aren't stopping until we stop the violence. But I really appreciate your support, and you're right. We ought to keep working on the right laws and the right approaches, and we can make a difference. So I really thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to pull all this together. We've got a lot of work to do. We're dealing with a very big challenge. We need help. We need help from the federal government. We need a real effort to stop the flow of guns into New York City. We need help from the state government. We need those on parole to get support, not just to be dumped on New York City with no help. It's not fair to them, it's not fair to their families, it's not fair to the people in New York City. And you heard from the district attorney, you heard from people who support compassionately folks who are coming back. We need a change, and I think we can achieve that change this week in Albany. 
the leaders you heard from believe it can be done. I believe it can be done. We need the people to call for it as well. Let's get that done. And then we got work to do. For the rest of this year, we're going to be dealing with a, a major challenge. We can do better with the laws that are good laws, that are important laws, that are reforms we needed. We needed the discovery reform. It was the right thing to do. Now let's make some of the tweaks and revisions we need to protect witnesses, to make sure that the trials actually occur. We needed the bail reform law. It was the right thing to do. We made some tweaks all working together with the legislature last year. That was a step forward. There's some more to do. We're going to continue that conversation. When the legislature comes back, there's another chance to act. But right now, the focus is on the parole bill. It will make a huge difference. It will help us stop violence, period, and save lives. So to all our colleagues in the legislature, help New York City this week. You can do something historic and something that will protect your constituents and all New Yorkers. Okay. Let me go to what we talk about every day, of course, while we're fighting the scourge of gun violence. We're fighting COVID every day, and we're building a recovery for all of us. And even though we're dealing with the challenges related to violence, thank God we can see and feel the recovery around us. I was all over the city this weekend, so many people out, so many people engaging again, feeling more freedom because we've been fighting back COVID. You can see the level of activity rising, more jobs coming back. This is what we need. And it's also going to help keep us safe because I guarantee you more recovery equals less violence. Obviously, fighting back the violence helps the recovery as well. We're going to have to do all of that at once. But let's talk about fighting COVID, which has always been the prerequisite for ending this crisis. And when it comes to that, it means vaccinations. Vaccinations equal freedom. And we've got more good news today on the vaccination front. We now have hit the lowest COVID level since the crisis began. Today's COVID positivity in New York City, 0.71%. So we keep setting new and better records, pushing COVID down, down, down. Why? Because of vaccinations. As of today, 4.4 million New Yorkers have gotten at least their first dose. 4.4 million. And again, overwhelmingly folks who get their first dose come back and get their second dose. So these are signs of something good happening. Overall doses administered from the beginning, we've now passed 8.5 million doses. So more doses than people in the city now. This is wonderful. 8.5, uh, specifically 8,520,047 doses from the beginning. Now, what do we have to do next? We have to focus on young people. And we're having a lot of success going out to communities, reaching young people. Parents more and more want their kids vaccinated. They want this to be a summer full of joy and freedom. They want this to be the summer of New York City. So we are connecting with parents. We're connecting with young people. This is going to be a big part of what we do from this point on. Now, we know on top of that that some people just need a little extra encouragement, a little extra focus. So the incentives are helping with that. We've offered uh, tickets to the governor's ball, gym memberships, staycations. Uh, Thursday, we announced the first set of winners, more winners this coming Thursday. But now this week's prizes. So if you're out there, haven't decided yet to get vaccinated, but you're interested, here's a chance to really get a wonderful prize. I think a lot of New Yorkers will want to get vaccinated when they hear this. Ten people will win. Six packs of 30-day unlimited Metro cards. So basically, six months of unlimited Metro cards. Uh, this is something of tremendous value to so many New Yorkers. So if you're out there, you've been meaning to get vaccinated, you're ready to get vaccinated, just haven't gotten around to get vaccinated, go to one of the city-run sites, sign up to get vaccinated, qualify for these Metro cards. Amazing opportunity. These Contests and prizes will be going on for weeks ahead. We think it's going to make a big difference. If you're interested, go to vaccinefinder.nyc.gov slash benefits. Okay. Now, you can see the recovery growing all the time. You can see the comeback happening. But we want to amplify it. We want to make it bigger. And so this morning we have a big announcement about a citywide celebration of New York City a citywide moment to declare that New York City is back, a homecoming for New York City, where New Yorkers come out together to celebrate and support our city, where folks from all over the metropolitan region come back to their roots in the city to support New York City's comeback. 
This is going to be an amazing, memorable, once-in-a-lifetime week in New York City. It is the brainchild of Danny Meyer, who has been serving, I'm so appreciative, as the chair of the New York City Economic Development Corporation Board, uh, legendary for the work he has done in the hospitality industry and a great booster of New York City. When he came on board with our team, he said, let's do something to really pull all the pieces together. Let's have a homecoming week. And then we said, what would be the focal point? What would be the, the highlight of this week? And we decided to do something classic, iconic, a massive concert in Central Park to celebrate the rebirth of New York City. The concert will be in August. It will celebrate the summer of New York City, the comeback, and it will emphatically make the point there is no stopping New York. It's going to be a great lineup. And I know it's going to be a great lineup because we turn to one of literally the greatest figures in music industry history, Clive Davis, Brooklyn's own, Brooklyn born and bred, never forgot the city he loves. I turned to Clive, I said, I need the biggest, most extraordinary all-star lineup you can put together, heavy on New York artists. He said, I'm on it, I'm gonna make it happen. So in August, get ready for an unforgettable week, a once in a lifetime concert, and a moment that really says New York City's back. All right. As we do every day, let's do our indicators. And thank God, again, the indicators give us good news. Number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 59 patients. This is unbelievable. This number is so low. That, uh, confirmed positivity, 8.47%. 8.47% confirmed positivity among the folks in the hospitals. Hospitalization rate, 046 per 100,000. See that line just goes straight down. That's what we need more of. Now, number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. Days report 204 cases. Another example, just constant progress. And number three, percentage of people testing citywide positive for COVID-19. Record-setting figure today on a seven-day rolling average, 0.71%. People said a couple weeks ago, oh, this is as low as it can go. No, nope, it can go lower. And we're going to fight to make it lower. Go out, get vaccinated. Okay, a few words in Spanish now. I'm going to go back to the topic of how we stop gun violence. Este fin de semana, perdimos a dos jóvenes por la violencia armada. La ciudad no puede hacerlo sola. Necesitamos que el Estado también tome acción. Ya es suficiente. Obre necesita aprobar la ley para fortalecer el apoyo para las personas en libertad condicional. With that, we turn to our colleagues in the media, and please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined today by Marcus Soler, the director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, by Dr. Choksi, and by senior advisor, Dr. Jay Varma. First question today goes to Marla from WCBS 880. Good morning, Mayor, and um, everyone else on the call. The um, the shootings over the weekend, especially the shooting of uh, little Justin Wallace, uh, sparked a lot of debate among the candidates for mayor, uh, with your former sanitation commissioner, Catherine Garcia, saying there's something broken in our political system when public safety has become more about ideology than about following the data and solving the problem. What are your short-term solutions to getting these guns off the street and stopping this violence as we head into what could be a very hot and possibly violent summer? Marla, it's a combination and it has to all be done at once. NYPD is getting the guns off the streets. We've been setting records this year for getting guns off the streets. That work must continue, must deepen, and I've talked to the leadership of the NYPD, and they're constantly innovating new ways to get guns off the street. We need that. We need more federal cooperation to stop the flow of the guns into New York City. We need this legislation in Albany. That could happen right now, this week, to help us address parolees coming back. Uh, all of these things, they are going to add up, but it's going to take intense, constant work to fight back the violence. Uh, this is, to me, a crucial moment for New York City. We've been through hell. We're coming back in so many ways. The health situation getting better all the times. 
Our schools are coming back in September. Our economy is coming back. You can see jobs coming back. The piece we got to get right now is public safety. We need help from Washington. We need help from Albany. And we're going to do everything in our power here to turn this corner. Go ahead, Marla. Can you tell us why uh, the focus on state parolees? Is there evidence that uh, parolees are committing these crimes? Yeah, why Marla. Why so much uh, focus on that? Marla, yeah. this is something that uh, our Office of Criminal Justice, and I'll turn to Marco Soler in a moment, who's the director. Our Office of Criminal Justice here at the mayor's office has been tracking this reality uh, more and more in the recent months we've seen a problem. NYPD has been calling out this reality, too. We've been talking to our colleagues in Albany over the last weeks about this is something that we're seeing worse than what we saw in the past. And the fact that parolees are too often the victims of violence, but also the perpetrators of violence, means we have to do something differently. We have to do it quickly. So in terms of the evidence that we've seen uh, from the beginning of COVID till now, and particularly picking up recently, uh, Marco Soler, would you please give a quick summary of the facts that you're seeing? Yes, Mr. Mayor, very quick summary. We have increased of about 10% of all shootings being driven by uh, people on parole to about 17% when in 2020 and when the pandemic started. And we don't see a necessary signs and that it is slowing down. And there are all the indicators as the mayor indicated, that parolees are involved in shootings as also as victims in greater race than before. That's the bottom line, Marla, and we'll get you all the background facts. But we have been watching this trend. It's gotten worse. We need to act on it quickly. The next is Andrew Stiff from WNBC. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. Uh, first question is about the mayor's race. Mayor, you have described it as very early in the process many times, but we are now only five days away from early voting. So I wonder uh, your state of where things stand now and what specifically you made of AOC endorsing Maya Wiley over the weekend. Um, Andrew, uh, it's not late anymore, I'll give you that. Um, but I still think a huge percentage of New Yorkers have not fully focused and have not made their final decisions. Uh, this is probably the most fluid mayor's race I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and obviously the focus on COVID, which is where people should be focused, have been focused. Uh, the fact that life has been disrupted. It's a June primary, not a September primary. We've got ranked choice voting for the first time. It's a very, very fluid situation. So I think uh, people are finally starting to focus. Um, the investigation now, the sort of careful, thoughtful look at each candidate is what's going on in the minds of New Yorkers. And what I'd say to all of you in the media is, you know, this is the last chance for you to tell New Yorkers everything that you have on each of these candidates because so, so many New Yorkers, they really don't know these candidates yet. And it's really crucial that they all get examined uh, and people get to make a decision with a lot more information on the table. So I honestly believe a lot of people are going to decide in the last day or two. Uh, and we got to shed as much light as possible in the meantime. Go ahead, Andrew. I did note you didn't answer my, my part about AOC endorsing Wiley. So if you'd like to, as, at the start of my second question, you can. My second question is about the Central Park mega concert. Uh, how many people you would anticipate attending this event when you expect to have the artist finalized and uh, whether there are any concerns, not about the outdoor gathering, but about people uh, gathering indoors after the fest? So on your uh, previous point, I'm not going to prognosticate about different uh, developments in the race. I have a lot of respect for AOC, but again, there's a lot of moving parts to this race, so it's just too early to tell what's going on here. Um, on the concert, it's going to be amazing. I can tell you August. I can tell you all-star lineup, uh, specific dates being nailed down. Obviously, Central Park, we're going to have a huge crowd. We're going to keep it safe. Uh, I think given what you saw just this morning, uh, on the COVID positivity on June 7th, and we're talking about a concert a couple of months away, I feel very good about our ability to keep people safe outdoors and indoors. The next is Jenna DeAngelis from WCBS. 
Good morning, Mayor de Blasio. Hi, Jenna. How you doing? I'm good. Hope you're well, too. Um, so it's great to see the vaccination numbers. You shared the numbers going up. Um, but when you take a close look at the numbers by demographic, vaccinations significantly lower in black and brown communities. There's 25% of the black community fully vaccinated. Hispanic Latino is at 31%. So what's being done by the city specifically to make sure that these communities are protected from COVID and get vaccinated? Jenna, a nonstop effort. I'll turn to Dr. Choksi, but I'll tell you, um, the effort at the community level is extraordinary and growing. Uh, the outreach efforts overwhelmingly are focused in communities of color, particularly on young people more and more, because we think that's a tremendous area to reach a lot more New Yorkers. We think a lot of parents are going to be ready to have their kids vaccinated, particularly the youngest kids. Um, it is about engaging houses of worship. It's about being ubiquitous in public housing. We're going to do all of the above. And the numbers keep moving. Dr. Choksi can give you a flavor of what he's seeing, but we're seeing that gap start to close. Uh, less and less hesitancy in communities of color, more people coming forward, but we've got to be there at the moment someone is ready. And look, I mean, we've got 4.4 million New Yorkers with at least one dose. Uh, we're just going to keep driving that. It's not going to stop. We're going to keep driving it and reach people at the right moment. Go ahead, Dr. Choksi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And as you said, equity has been a central pillar of vaccination campaign from the beginning. Um, but this phase of our vaccination campaign has revolved around convenience and conversations. Convenience in the sense of being ubiquitous, as the mayor has said, making sure that we are getting further out into uh, neighborhoods, including those neighborhoods that do have lower vaccination rates such as in the Bronx or in Eastern Brooklyn or in parts of Queens, uh, bringing our mobile vaccination efforts there and also partnering with those community-based clinics, uh, including federally qualified health centers um, who have been serving those communities for decades upon decades. And the second part is around conversations. It's really about having uh, the, the questions that people have about the vaccines answered by people whom they trust. Um, that's often faith leaders, it's community-based organizations, uh, but it's also sometimes neighbors and family members. And so we have worked in partnership with all of those groups to make sure that people are sharing their stories about why they chose to get vaccinated, answering questions, and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations that can change minds. And we are seeing that yield uh, improved uh, vaccination rates. Uh, and we're going to continue um, focusing those efforts to get as many people vaccinated as possible in the coming week. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Jenna. Um, I mean, do you have a personal message to the people who still, despite you know people being in the houses of worship and all these places, still are just not taking it to yeah. try to really close that gap? Thank you. I'll offer my personal message, and I want Dr. Choksi to offer his as well. Here's what I want to say. Look, I'm going to speak as a parent. Protect your children, get them vaccinated. The vaccine is safe, it's the Pfizer vaccine for kids 12 to 17. We want our kids safe, it's the number one thing we feel as parents, here's a way to do it. It's proven, it's safe, it's free, it's effective. So I'm appealing to parents, this is the time to protect our children with the vaccine. Dr. Choksi, your appeal. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'll share what I've said to my own patients, which is that vaccines help us develop immunity without disease. Uh, and that's the bottom line. We have safe, effective vaccines that have already saved lives, uh, both here in New York City as well as around the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, for yourself, for your family members, for your neighbors, for our city, um, vaccination is the key to a safe summer um, and to all of the joy, uh, particularly the things that you may have missed out on over the last few months. Thank you, go ahead. The next is Paul from the Staten Island Advance. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor, how you doing? Good, Paul, how you been? Good, thank you. Um, Congresswoman Meliotakis and Borough President Otto held a press conference earlier today um, essentially, the Army Corps of Engineers declined to handle uh, environmental remediation work for the massive seawall project. 
Uh, we're just hoping to get your reaction and see where the city stands on that work. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, this ball game ain't over. Let me tell you, I spoke to the borough president about it. Um, we've got to get this done. We're going to appeal to the federal government. I spoke to the Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, on this topic. Uh, she was very receptive to understanding uh, what the federal government could do because, as you know, this is on federal land where uh, some of the crucial work has to happen. Um, we are not going to give up. We're going to get this done one way or another. We really have to have the federal government involvement. We need uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Park Service, whatever combination, the Interior Department, whatever combination to get it done. But we must get it done. Uh, so I'm not giving up. I know Borough President Otto's not giving up. We'll be engaging uh, both our U.S. Senators. we got to get this done. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you for that. Um, also, a video, uh, we published a video over the weekend of uh, essentially a fox attacking a turkey. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of where the city is on addressing some of the wildlife concerns in Staten Island, the deer, the turkey, uh, et cetera. Yeah, Paul, that, look, an ongoing issue in Staten Island, uh, in other parts of the five boroughs, and all over the country now. I mean, wildlife is coming into cities. It's a, it's a major change in our lives. Um, Parks Department plays a role. ASPCA plays a role. There's different elements to the equation. We're going to keep uh, working on our tactics to get it right. It, it's a tough situation because it's new and unpredictable. Um, but look, I appreciate that people are concerned about safety. Um, homeowners are concerned about their property. Uh, all I can say is we're going to keep working with the people of Staten Island to address these issues in a smart and effective and a humane way. The next is Jake Offenharts from Gothamist. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Jake, how you been? I'm okay. I wanted to ask you about the new curfew at some public parks that we're seeing. Um, over the weekend, we saw SRG officers arrest 23 people in Washington Square. In some cases, this was violent. We also saw police seal Tompkins um, in the East Village without any notice to the community hours before its scheduled closure. So can you first say whether you think the curfew at Washington Square Park should continue this weekend? And did you direct the NYPD to close down Tompkins on Saturday, or was that a decision they made on their own? Uh, on that one, it's a situation that we're seeing in a couple of places, as you said, Jake, and that's a decision that local police commanders have to make based on what they see. So I just was not involved in that one, but I understand and appreciate that if they see a situation where it makes sense to effectuate a closure, I think that's the smart thing to do. Uh, the Washington Square Park curfew, we've had many conversations here at City Hall and with One Police Plaza about that. I think it's also the right thing to do for this moment. Uh, I'd like to see the point come where no longer necessary, but we've had a series of issues and problems, and I think a proactive approach is the right way to do it. Go ahead, Jake. Okay, so I, I guess it sounds like what you're saying is you are you are okay with police making the decision to unilaterally close parks without any sort of public notice to the community. Um, I, I think a lot of New Yorkers would point out that 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 seems like kind of a uh, infringement on the public square and I'm wondering what your response to that is um, and I also just wanted to get you to kind of respond to what I heard from some police this weekend um, basically we, we saw them shut down this impromptu dance party around the speaker um, I saw them tell a band that they couldn't play at Tompkins where they've been playing for much of the last year and I heard from an officer that this is because there's no parties in city parks um, do you agree with that statement? And are you are you concerned about the way police are enforcing these rules in public parks right now? Uh, Jake, I don't know about that statement. I didn't really fully understand that statement, but let me speak to the bigger question you're asking. And I appreciate you're saying the public square and what is that balance? Um, this is one of the most open cities in the world and it will always be and it must be. When we see a recurrent pattern of problems, we've got to address them proactively. Uh, addressing them reactively it just doesn't work as well and unfortunately can lead to more conflict and I think we all agree we need a more peaceful dynamic in our communities. So we've learned a lot of things in the last year or two and one of the lessons is proactive action is better. 
It's something that happens rarely, honestly. It's not needed in the vast majority of places, but it is needed sometimes. Um, it's something we want to do carefully, sparingly. Uh, in all situations, we understand the importance of dialogue and particularly having our community affairs officers up front trying to resolve issues whenever possible. But sometimes the best way to avoid conflict and also address real community concerns about noise or violence is to do something proactively. So we'll do it when necessary. I don't think you'll see it that often, but we'll do it when necessary. Next is Sean from the Daily News. Yeah, thanks for taking my question, Mayor. Um, I guess, yeah, following up on, on Jake's question, um, you know, video that circulated from, from the curfew enforcement over the weekend showed officers in riot gear chasing people through the streets. I mean, I think, you know, there were kind of flashbacks to last summer where there were much where there were similar scenes, albeit on a bigger scale. So I guess, you know, to put it simply, is officers in riot gear the right answer? Is there a less heavy-handed way to, to go about curfew enforcement, if that's what, this is, what you want? Yeah, and I appreciate the question, Sean, because we all use that term. Uh, we're all used to that term. Um, uh, good observation was made by Deputy Commissioner John Miller that um, when there are officers unfortunately confronting people who are throwing projectiles at them, most notably bottles, um, to put on a helmet is the right thing to do to protect the officer. That's the extent of the gear change in most cases. So I do think it's fair to say this is a not a overly dramatic action to simply provide some protection to officers. What we need to do is have folks who have a disagreement not throw things, uh, talk about it, work it through whenever humanly possible. It is not the same as last summer, obviously. We don't want it to be the same as last summer. Um, what we're going to do consistently is set clear rules, uh, have community affairs up front, uh, but if, unfortunately, folks initiate violence towards their fellow New Yorkers or towards police officers, that has to be addressed. That's very, very few people, Sean. Let's be clear. That's very few people at this point. When it happens, we'll address it. The vast majority of New Yorkers just want a peaceful summer. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, so thanks for that. I mean, I guess in a slightly related vein, there's this kind of new theme in the mayoral race. The two, front, two of the front runners, Eric Adams and Andrew Yang, sounding strongly pro-cop, anti-budget reduction to the NYPD. That's raised criticism from people like AOC saying front riders might take the city back to Giuliani-style over-policing of the city, which is something really a hallmark of your administration was fighting that style of policing. So I guess the question to me is, why aren't you coming out in favor of one of the progressives, like your former employee, Maya Wiley, who's like very anti-Giuliani-style policing? Well, Sean, fair question, but a much more complicated reality than, than that. We cannot go back to the years of Giuliani when this city was horribly divided and it was setting us back. Uh, we cannot go back to the years of Michael Bloomberg and the unconstitutional and broken use of stop and frisk. The best years were the six years before the pandemic. Everyone saw it with your own eyes. Crime went down six years in a row better relationship between police and community, uh, constant series of reforms. That combination worked. We can get back to that. We will stop this gun violence. We will turn the corner. Uh, we can't go back to the bad old days in any sense. Some people say bad old days, they mean the 1970s, but there was also the bad old days of Giuliani and Bloomberg when people's rights weren't respected, where there was a massive split between police and community. We can't have any of those things happen. What I anticipate is, as we get past the impact of the pandemic, we will go back to the full use of neighborhood policing, full active courts, consequences for crimes, we'll turn the corner on gun violence, we'll invest more in communities, cure violence movement, uh, crisis management system, that's the way forward. I'm watching all the candidates, Sean, and it's not as simple as, you know, one wants to go back to Giuliani and the other one doesn't. It's not even close to that. There are a number of candidates who want to keep making reform and keep the city safe. And that's the direction I believe in. If at some point I think it's important to say something about specific candidates, I certainly will. Uh, the next is Katie Honan from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, uh, good morning, Mayor Blasio. How are you? Hey, Katie, how you been? I'm good. Um, I wanted to ask a follow-up on 
um, what you were speaking about earlier, particularly with the death of Justin Wallace. I know you were focusing a lot on parole and the parole law, but in this instance, I guess, what does that have to do with this instance? I don't know if you have information about the suspect, but could you speak a little bit about what the city will do um, in terms of getting, I guess, getting guns off the street, which seems to be the issue at play here? Um, the number one thing that we need that we can't control is the efforts to stop the guns from coming here from out of state. Now, let's be honest and clear about this. Um, the thing that would help us the most is actual federal laws to stop the massive proliferation of gun ownership that has occurred, particularly during the pandemic. So the NYPD does constant activity to stop the flow of guns into New York City, but the whole structural reality of this country is broken. That's the thing that would help us the most. But that being said, we don't have that yet. So we have to act on every other piece of the equation. Uh, what folks at our Office of Criminal Justice will say and the NYPD have said are the parole issue is looming larger and larger. It's something we can fix. It's something we can address right now. We've proven it with the city jails. So the reason we're talking about today is for weeks and weeks we've been trying to create some momentum in Albany. We finally have that momentum. We can get this bill done now in combination with more police efforts to get gun off the streets, in combination with efforts to stop retaliation by the Cure Violence Movement Crisis Management System, in combination with getting the courts 100% up and running, in combination with gang takedowns, which you will be seeing more of coming up. We need all of these pieces to turn the tide. Go ahead, Katie. Thanks, and on a, a completely separate topic, um, what more can you tell us about this homecoming? It seems. So far, it seems a little Manhattan-centric. I know, I know you usually have a little bit of love for the other boroughs, the outer boroughs. So uh, I call Manhattan an outer borough, but that's me. But what else can you tell us about what would be planned that week for the rest of the city? I appreciate Manhattan deeply, but my heart is in the whole of New York City. My heart's in Brooklyn. My heart's where I come from, and my heart's in all the boroughs that make up 7 million of us. So this focal point is in Central Park because that is obviously an iconic location and a place where we can put together an amazing, huge concert to celebrate our rebirth. But there will be major activities in all five boroughs. So I want to be clear, more details to come, but this is very much a five borough vision of a homecoming week. We want people to come out, participate, all the people in New York City participate, but we also want people to come back to New York City from the whole metropolitan area. Look. Uh, folks in the suburbs and the tri-state area appreciate and love New York City, and for most of them, New York City is where their roots are. Time to come home, time to help us move forward. This homecoming week is going to be something very, very special. Last question for today goes to Yoav from the city. I just wanted to ask you, um, when, when the last time you, you met or spoke with the uh, about the night class was, if you recall? Uh, certainly it's been many months since I spoke to anyone connected to uh, that organization. I can't tell you exact day, but months and months for sure. Go ahead, Yoav. Uh, I, I just wanted to go back to the, uh, the Justin Wallace death. Um, I guess there, there's a group of people that feel like the um, the balance between public access to public places and the need for police to keep these areas safe has tilted a bit in, in favor of um, the public safety aspect. You, you had the um, the barriers up around the Columbus statues for many, many months. You had barriers outside of precincts for many months. You had whole streets that were closed off and public plazas. And, and I, I just wonder, I, I guess, wh whether you think um, the police are managing to strike the right balance here. I do. I do. Yo, Ab, it's a really good question. And again, I appreciate when Jake said, you know, the protecting the public square, I value that deeply. Look, 
we saw for years in this country under President Trump an assault on our democracy. I think a lot of times you and others are asking questions saying, are we protecting our democratic norms? Are we protecting freedom of speech, freedom of assembly? Of course we are. And we will always. New York City is the open city. New York City is the most small d democratic place in the country, a place for everyone. We'll always protect that. We also have gone through an unprecedented crisis that we're still living with. And we had to strike a balance. And one of the things that I decided a long time ago was we were not going to take the kinds of risks that could lead to the loss of life. We were not going to see a situation of upheaval going on for months and months and months. We were not going to see uh, the attacks that we saw on property in some of the other cities in this country that went on for weeks or months. Uh, we weren't going to see attacks on civilians or people in uniform or police precinct. We weren't going to have any of that here. We were going to have peace. We were going to have the ability to move forward out of this pandemic. It took a lot of work to strike that balance, but it was struck. We learned lessons. There's things we have to do better. But when you're talking about parks, for example, in residential communities, places where we've seen some consistent problems, getting ahead of those problems, having an earlier closing time, uh, being smart about it, I think is the kind of thing we do now at this moment in history to get through some of the challenges we're facing. But we will overcome those challenges. And I think this is a moment that won't last long if we all do what we need to do. So this is a perfect way to conclude. Look. We've been through the greatest crisis in the history of New York City. We're coming out of it really fast. COVID, lowest rate since the beginning. Jobs coming back, activity coming back, schools coming back. But there's still work to do, particularly for the summer, to assure public safety and to finish our comeback. Once we do that, I think we move forward really fast and deeply back to where we were before the pandemic. We had the most jobs in our history and so many things that were working right in this city. We were the safest big city in America. We will be again. We've got work to do. We need help from Albany this week. We need help from the federal government, and we're going to help ourselves. But there's no question in my mind we turn the corner on all of this, and we move forward. Thank you, everybody.